Hello. Ah, my microphone is working. Welcome to another talk from me about one of my favorite tools of Linux, which I'm really using a lot, sometimes every day, at least every week. But today I want to talk about different aspects about tracing, getting timestamps, doing time analysis, things like that. Um, yeah, I'm doing, uh, the outline of the talk is really uh, showing where you get the documentation from, how s uh, I tried to do a very short introduction to s -trace. Who has never used s before? Okay, so, uh, but I try to keep, sorry? No, I no, wouldn't say. Th th then it's the perfect talk for you, uh, knowing that you missed that uh, tool for a lot of things. But I try to keep the introduction very short. Last time I gave the talk, the 45 minutes have been over uh, when I did the introduction. I did a little, lot of open source, even at school time in the early 80s and late 70s. My first open source experience was porting tech in 1996 to our university, way before we had Linux and all the fun things. I got addicted to Unix in 87 already, but only the proprietary Unixes, because in Germany we didn't have source licenses. And I was playing even the very first Intel, Intel PC processor, not the earlier ones. And I always found the assembly model horrible and even the 386 and I didn't like it. And in 92, I bought a Intel PC just to get Linux running on it because then I had my own source code, yes. And I was an X386 core team for quite a while, writing graphics driver for S3 chips until I left university. And meanwhile, I'm, I was, was addicted to doing low level hardware things, graphics drivers by any means, whatever is not working, get it working for me, friends, university, now for in my first job for customers and now for Bosch, in our own project, and doing everything but Windows and using a lot of open source, still trying to at least file back bugs or improvements, but it's not going that much anymore, unfortunately. So where do you get information from s -trace? There's a wonderful one page about that. Um, S-Trace is using the P-Trace system call. I won't show that this P-Trace is used for all the debugging. You can control a second process. You can say stop it, run it, do a lot of interesting things with it. Um, if you're a little bit used to S-Trace, you also might think about writing your own tooling things with just the P-Trace call. It's quite interesting. For the man page things in Unix, who's not aware of the man command, then even that talk is for you. It's, yeah, you get all the documentation, for example, now for section two, the write command, because we are, uh, the S-trace and P-trace is all about the interface between user processes and kernel, the POSIX interface. You can trace the system calls. There's a second tool, which is not on that slide, maybe it's coming. It's L-trace, the library trace thing, where you can trace from your program into shared library calls, so all the libc things, printf, fopen, whatever which is in the user space. There you get even more output and it's even more difficult to understand things, but now I'm concentrating on S-Trace, how to tr uh, trace all the system calls, which are interesting for us and where you can see a little bit what your program is doing, what the Linux kernel is doing and how to understand things. The web page from S-Trace is S-Trace.io. There you get also a lot of information. And I learned quite a lot uh, by one of the contributors or that contributor, I don't know exactly, a, a guy from Greece, Dimitri Levin, who at least gave a lot of interesting talks at Fostum, uh, one of the nice conference, weekend conferences in Brussels every start of the year and start of February. For other aspects uh, about S-Trace, I gave some talks almost 10 years ago. Uh, and you can find the papers also on this um, with that URL or now with the slides. And the one is for understanding the S-Trace system call thing and what it can do for you and, and explaining a little bit and giving examples. And the second one is using S-Trace to understand what your shell, your command line interface is doing. Then you can speci uh, specifically look on what's the bash doing if you enter command with and without quotes, with star, without star, and you can directly see what happens and learn a little bit. At least for me, it's always easy. If I see something, then I can understand and learn things. So that's for and also learning how the shell things are working. It can be quite useful, or at least about giving talks for that and explaining how it's working and how you can see if, why things happen. So a very short introduction to S-Trace. The easy method is you say S-Trace 
whatever command and run it. And when I'm in presentation mode, I cannot cut and paste things, but if, if you use the slides, you can do that. So let's see. So I can do things like that, astray, some echo command, and hello, Bill Bowen, whatever. You get a lot of output already. And scrolling up, where did I start it? Where's my command? Here's the SR1 command. Do that and run it again. So this is the astrace command, and you will get all the system calls. The first one is execve. You please execute that binary with those command line arguments and then you can see how it's loading the shared library, libc something. Uh, I have the wrong classes here. You can see opening in the libc and whatever. Have a look at that, interpret that, uh, and then just pick the things which you're interested in. Right now we're interested about echo does some output and you will notice down here there's a write call. Say, ah, oh, write system call. This is why I also put the man page for write section to the system call and the right system call needs three parameters, a file descriptor, a string and how many bytes there are, ah, yeah, <laughs> up to here. So this is the right system call, or it's getting messy and it will tell, uh, please write from that memory area string the first 21 characters. Then it's jumping into the kernel, the kernel does the write. This is why now the string comes in. And then it returns from the kernel and says, okay, here, this is the return from the kernel. And it said, uh, the write system call returns 21. I've written 21 bytes for you. There could be a different return code if you try to write on a disk uh, and the disk is full and say, oh, zero, I didn't write anything or if the device does not work, whatever. If you write into pipe, maybe not all the data is going into pipe. So, and we can see it's reading some things. So very basics. There are some examples and in the papers you find a lot of things. So method one is just s trace some command. Um, ah, if I do the same thing, <laughs> I like running almost every command with time in front because I wonder how long does it take to start my editor? How long does it take to compile programs? If I do that, s trace time, whatever. Um, then the output looks completely different. And if I look here, <laughs> oh, we always can have a look. What happens if I do that without this S trace command? And it says, hello, Bilbao. And it says, blah, 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 a lot of timing and CPU and whatever. If I do the same with S trace, um, we will see a lot of timing, real blah, backslash T is a top going to the next columns, some more numbers, user, another top. Um, if you look carefully, we don't see any write hello bibao anymore. This is because this command is only tracing the time command. And time will create a f uh, child process. Uh, we should be able to see that somewhere on top. I, I need my other glasses. So somewhere there is a clone call and it forks the process and in the uh, clone Sorry, I can't pick it right now. And only that uh, second. Uh, was, <laughs> so I see the sick child when it will read. Ah, here, exactly. Oh, thank you very much. So the clone will just create a second process. We, we get the process number here. And in that process, um, it will do the echo and the write, which I've seen before, but you don't see that because it's only tracing the time command. If I want to see all the processes, the first very important option is dash F, follow child processes. And whenever you don't know, just put it to about everything because uh, if you don't know if it's executing subcommands and whatever, or it's threats. And if you do that, and, and we are lucky somewhere, oh, we can see the hello Bilbao again. This is now, now since we are running uh, trace on multiple commands, it will show, oh, this is process ID, blah, 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 whatever. And, and you see, and then you have to have a careful look on for which process it's doing, then that you can separate where the output is coming from. And so this is output from the first child process. We don't have only the single one, and this is now returning to the main process, where we don't see any process ID, to my surprise. Doesn't matter. So. Um, First method, S trace, 
al al almost always use the dash f option and run your commands and see how it's going. The second method is you can do a dash p processes ID. So if something is already running your servers, whatever, you just can attach to it and can just watch it. Also, if uh, that process has sub-threads and whatever, I always use minus F. Um, and you can just stop. In the first case, if you press Ctrl C, you will stop the command itself. So if it's running for a long time, it's, uh, then you will kill the command and everything. If you just uh, attach to a process with S minus P, you can press Control C, you stop the S trace, but your command, your server, your database, whatever, is still continu continuing. So it's quite nice also um, if, for example, startup is very time time consuming or whatever, you don't want to trace everything, but ODC, SSH server, a single connection. So something is not working, then you can attach to the SSH daemon, but you don't have to do that while it's starting up or whatever your topics are. Attaching to other processes. In general, it only works if it, the pro, you start the process in your same terminal, because there is some uh, oops, kernel protection mechanism in the meantime, and there's a proxys, whatever, variable, ptrace, you have to look into that variable. If you, I can't show it right now because, yeah, I've opened up the thing, uh, I can, and I cannot do cut, cut and paste here. So if that thing is not non-zero, and you have a second terminal, so, <laughs> I would do something like that. Just give me the processes, process ID for this terminal. And I would do an S trace, my dash P for 3070. Then in most of the distributions, you will get a permission denied error because this terminal is not allowed to uh, trace any processes from any other terminal or whatever. You're, as a regular user, you're only allowed to trace your own things anyway. So one solution is always to um, sudo. Root is allowed to do everything. Then you can do the attachment, but that's tedious and you don't want to run all these things as root. Uh, the correct way, no, I'm not sure if it's correct or not. The, the better way might be um, you write zero to that uh, kernel variable and then at least all your terminals from your user are allowed to trace and debug themselves. Might be helpful. Uh, still, you cannot trace commands from other users, from root, whatever. So if you try to trace something from root, from other users, you always have to root yourself. So, but it's, if you get errors here with dash p, use that, change that variable. Uh, so far, we have seen S trace is outputting everything to the terminal. It's quite useful. I always like, start like that to get an idea: what is the thing doing? What I might be interested in? How uh, how I can filter things? So uh, one method is you with dash o output file. You write everything to a terminal uh, to a file. Sorry, and then your file is called output dot S trace whatever. Choose your names. My S trace uh, files are always called. Uh, wrong. Oh, we don't need the terminal anymore. Okay. Uh, uppercase O, one, two, three, four, whatever. If it's uppercase O, it's an S trace file. Now I click. What happened here? Okay, yeah. Outputs. Um, the same as before, if I just do S size dash R output tool, I only get the program itself, no children. If I do uh, the dash F option, all the children things, uh, we will see the output in details shortly, hopefully. Oh. Um, you get a single output file. If you use the uh, option F twice, no matter if it's dash F, dash F, or you can combine them almost all in one dash FF thing, then you will get uh, not a single output file, second terminal, but you get something like that. So here I was working, and this one is a single output file. It was called uart.3s output file. Or with double F, you get uh, a single file with uh, the process ID attached for every single process or thread or whatever. That can be quite useful. Uh, so you have everything combined, and depending on what you're looking for and how you want to analyze things, it's important to understand the differences, and especially for the timestamps and other things. It's, mm, we'll see. 
Um, there are a few options which help you how much information you will get. Uh, read the man page for all the options. It's really a play around and depending what you're looking for. The dash V is more verbal. Uh, maybe I can show that one very quickly. Some of the... Uh, uh, echo... Uh, yeah. We had the echo whatever command. Uh, next slide will show that I can do with dash E... Oops. With dash E I can just ask for tracing single X, X, v, single or multiple kernel commands, not everything. And if I do that on a regular base, you can see it's trying XXVE. And it looks, so this is an option, for example, to see how the path lookup works. And now it's trying to find echo in dot cargo bin, whatever local bin, and until it finally finds and X, XX succeeds. This is a one point, but it shows here only that there are um, 159 variables for whatever this is the environment. And if you have a very long argument list, then it also won't show up everything. And this is what the option dash V is for being ver most, oops. Oh, we can also do that like that. We can combine options and even the F and whatever. So saving some follow children. And these things. And now with verbos, for example, you get the full environment and the full command line and things like that. Actually, if you look closely, it's not completely full because it says <laughs> session dot dot dot. Because sh all strings will be abbreviated, all file names. If you long file names, um, it's still a problem that it only shows the first don't know, 20 whatever characters. So and if you're more um, another system call where it's useful having the verbose option is for uh, all the stat options. If it's looking for status, information on files, if it look, is the file there uh, with stat, you get the file size, the permissions and all the things. They will be shown in the S trace output because it's a lot of bulky things then only if you use the dash V. For the strings, we just noticed um, not, all, not all strings are shown completely with a lot of dot dot dot, dot things. Then you can also do, that's what I very often as some larger number depending on, so for this strings I think 999 is a large number. You can, for other strings, if you want to trace the whole reading and writing of files or your network tra traffic, whatever, uh, now there are no dots anymore and this is, uh, when I cl double click on that, this is a single command line. So this is now our start of a single command line to be, because it's only doing that exec VE here it starts. You see it's a huge thing because these are the 159 whatever environment variables can be useful for tracing that things and see which sub processes, um, for example, changes your path if it's not working well, because you see then also path for everything, write it to a file, look for things. Um, sometimes if you want to play with the strings, which I want to do later also, can be useful um, if there's binary stuff. Uh, <laughs> um, we could have seen that before if we open the libc and read things, binary things will be output in octal with backslash zero, one, two, three, in a very, for me, confusing syntax, which is a little bit different to what the C standard is doing. And for that reason, uh, I found a few years ago, uh, there's an option that uh, all the binary things, you can also get hexadecimal, which is a little bit easier. Do we find, uh, ah. Uh, it still outputs the regular things like backslash n, backslash t, whatever. Do you see anything with binaries? Yeah, here. The regular binary things will be backslash x, always two digits then, so it's easier to parse and read in some cases. And if you do double x, uh, then all the output is completely in hex, even the printable ASCII things. Sometimes quite good for transferring things. So a lot of options and you can multi uh, set them multiple times. I think even verbos is possible to do it twice and does different things. What I already showed a little bit. Um, if you looked at that and you can run that S trace output for hours and look at it, what I'm looking for, what I'm waiting for, what, what's the event of write it to a file and uh, analyze it. S trace can slow down your processes because it's intercepting all system calls and it's intercepting and when being called and coming back. And if you do that, to a process which does a lot of I.O., 
huge database server, it can slow down things. Um, if you realize what you're interested in, for example, only file lookups, and I only want to see uh, one example would have been for this conference just uh, using S-trace with a single command line thing to get SBOM lists for what you're compiling and which files are affected. You just can use S-trace-e file. So you can say, I want to have the read and write system calls. I, we will do that in a minute, a few minutes. Uh, you get only read and write system calls for getting data and outputting data things. Uh, e is a meta file name, uh, a meta function name. Um, you will get a trace for all kernel calls which have file names involved. Open, start looking for things, everything where you find uh, also change mod, change directory. Everything with file names, so this is quite useful if you do that. You get about all information you want to have if a process is looking for config files, if it's opening things. If you know that you're running uh, into a method for doing SBOM, so I only want to know which files are really compiled into my tool. This is exactly what I'm doing for my project because I had to invent those tools a long time ago and we have a conf different hardware configurations and things and are really uh, running the whole make processes through S-trace, only tracing the open calls. That's not too much overhead because all the er other things are without S-trace and it's not doing adding anything for, if, for the system calls you're not tracing. Um, you can say s trace e open, which was working nice for a long time. You can all the open, uh, and, and never forget minus F because your make is making sub processes and the, the compiler is making sub processes, but so it's now f only for the selecting system calls. You can say minus F minus E open and you get all the open calls. In modern Linux systems, you won't get a lot of output anymore because typically uh, they are not using the open system call anymore, but open at. Modern things like we are not doing fork anymore, but we are doing clone, things like that. So, with op uh, you can also say open comma open at. You can like read and write, but you're never sure if next year there will be another open call. And in the meantime, it's possible to uh, provide regular expressions. Also for that, uh, doing a search on regular expressions, and this is quite nice. You can say minus e slash open. Just use everything with open in a string. It will also do open or whatever, so might be too many system calls traced, but if it's open 32, open 64, open whatever, you will get them all. Same is true for the start things, if you only try to figure out what your process is trying to find files, which uh, then do not exist, you can say uh, get all the start files or start 64 or everything with start and whatever. And when you do the full, full tracing, you see what's available, then you can pick. You also can exclude things uh, with an exclamation mark. You can say trace everything, but if you notice there's a single system call which comes very often and you, this is the only thing which interferes and you, you can't read the rest the remaining output, then you can say just f forget some tracing, few text, whatever. Now we're coming to timing. This time, so fi file operations, things like that, read the papers, a uh, lot of, uh, not a lot, there's more explanation and some examples how, what you can do. This time I want to play a little bit with timestamps and I do not want to click here. For timing, there are three important options, T, T and R. So lowercase T, uppercase T, because there was only one T for timing and relative, we'll show that in a second. For, you get some timestamps, you get a more detailed timestamp, you get an even more detailed timestamp. Uppercase T will show how long it's in the kernel, and R is a relative timestamp. Uh, the years before, if you did, my list stopped here because you, if you did, my, did minus R, give me the relative timestamp, you only got the relative timestamp, and the T, the absolute timestamp vanished. And now when I prepared that talk, start of the year and thought about that thing, I was very surprised that now you can mix absolute and relative time stamps and both show up. That's great because it's all information. I studied physics and if you measure things, also if you measure timing, try to get as much information as you can and filter out later and learn from it and try to understand things. And when I only had either relative or absolute timestamp, where it's clear you take the absolute timestamp and use your own tool to calculate deltas and things like that, but now we get that all for free. That's nice. So let's do a very quick 
play with these things. So what's the last command? So not now I'm only curious about the timing. So that you see that one. So with minus t, you just get hours, minutes, seconds. For a quick command, it's not very interesting. Um, if you do t twice, it's getting much better. Then you get hours, minutes, seconds, and microseconds. That's quite good, but if you run it for a very long time, you don't know, is it 12 o'clock today, 12 o'clock tomorrow? So if sometimes I run things for hours, days, whatever, and I do then later timing analysis, plots, whatever. This is all, and, and it's hard to parse hours, minutes, seconds, uh, getting useful numbers. So this is why you can put the lowercase t three times. And then it should just get the Unix and Linux time. This is all, these are the seconds from start of uh, Unix life, uh, uh, seconds since 1970, with microseconds. It's a quite nice resolution. Quick hint, if you have something like that and uh, see that dates later, and you don't know how to get back from that, it's also, you can say, please, uh, the date command can, a lot of, can do a lot of good things for you. And so if I date minus D, at sign and uh, any magic number and you get just the date in Unix in your time zone where you run, has, has, have been running those trace data. That can be quite useful. So back to <laughs> triple T. So this is what I typically do because then I just can pick those numbers, calculate things, make differences, whatever. It's, it's the easiest thing. Um, uppercase T, nothing happened with the times. But if you look closely, now we got a new column at the very end in angle brackets, and it will tell you how many microseconds the kernel call has been taken from calling the kernel to return. And that can be quite interesting and helpful. So uppercase T, you get the time within kernel. Um, we'll use that in a few minutes, yes. And to just show the last one. So only the relative time, sometimes it's sufficient. It will just tell you that that MAP was uh, running 300 microseconds after the close. Um, if you're looking for where did we get some delays, um, now this is not a, ah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sleep. Sleep for 0 0.3 seconds, that is not taking too much time. And if I write that things to an, Ah, horrible. To an output file. Uh, just look at the output file. So we have the timestamps and everything. Then you just can go for sort numeric your output file for the relative timestamps and pick the very last ones and we'll find something took 0 0.3 seconds before that close from something to close. Um, something took a long time and then you can look in your output again and look, oh, this is from last thing, it, to, uh, it took 0 0.3 seconds. And the last thing was the clock nano sleep. Ah, no, no big surprise. This is exactly my 0 0.3 seconds. If you do that with the S-trace getting more information, because that's the canonical thing which I do always do. So you could have the mm, three triple and whatever, and the R and everything. And looking at that thing again, I would sort now for, uh, that's now the relative thing is in the third col column because we have the absolute timestamp plus relative and whatever. And oops. And now if you do sort by third column, we get the same. Uh, and then we notice, uh, ah, blah blah blah, close. And we can now look in the output file for the absolute spot. Could have been that there's more relative timestamps like this, and it will show us here. And also, we can see that this kernel called the clock and undersleep, whatever, has been staying for 0 0.3 seconds in the kernel. So it would also have been possible, sometimes helpful. The point is here we see what's taking a long time in the kernel. So I can do. Hmm, Sort, say, my 
So my tabulating thing is now opening anchor bracket. Ah. So my keyboard is wrong and my glasses are wrong. But I try to, yes. Use the tabular for the angle bracket and now please sort for second column. This is not working if you have something which is reading and writing XML files, but in general, it, there are not too many opening and, and closing angle brackets. If I do that, no. now we really get the time in kernel because it happens could happen that you have a long time in user space before you do the next call. Yeah, you just count from one to one billion, whatever. Then the time between the calls is long, but you're doing real user work, whatever that is. And <clears throat> here you can see which system call really stayed the longest time in the kernel. Back. Uh, fun. I, I don't demonstrate it. So. You can use, now you can trace things, you see exactly when, which system call is happening. And in my old company, we had a, a department doing a lot of 3D uh, graphics and they've been very busy compiling things. So their compile time running on a big Silicon graphics machine took one hour, two hours, whatever. And since, uh, while this was uh, running, they couldn't do anything but drinking coffee. <clears throat> and uh, in that later, I have seen that wonderful XKCD comic. And what they did, uh, what, what I did for them is uh, one time with a very small example here, you can just look at that. Uh, I traced my LaTeX command running those slides, put everything with uh, full strings, relative time stamp, only the writes to the terminal, getting all the X things, whatever, to uh, PDF LaTeX S trace output. I can show that one. Yes. So this then, no, wrong terminal, second terminal. So this is, looks like that, what we just have seen. It's even longer lines. It's the process ID, the time before, from the last write and what it has written. And this almost looks like C code, except for the semicolons at the end are missing. It says, oh, I did that. So um, you can just use your favorite whatever formatting tool and reformat that, that you get the semicolons at the end of the right lines and uh, get that one. And then the output will look like that. And it's real C code, which comes out. It's and with the first number, I just do, there's a system called USleep doing microsecond sleep. This is exactly the numbers which we got for the relative timestamps multiplied by 1 million. And then you can call USleep, wait for until it's time for the doing the next write. And then you can just uh, fake whatever. My C program for that uh, is just use standard header main and include that S trace, modified S trace things. And if I run that, which has run at the same speed as it was doing before. That. So you can use that for um, being happy with XKCD. But uh, we, once we had real useful usage for that, uh, where we had a, a specific uh, timing pattern which showed up where a database failed and uh, over network calls, and we haven't been able to easily debug that because it was a long time going there. And after a while, uh, it showed up, it's a timing problem that we are running in race conditions. And I've been running s trace on a real client, getting that timing, and I have been able to reply uh, the same timing, which made it much, much easier triggering the bug. And then you had a nice method to analyze problems. So this is all you just can do there. I'm, I'm still compiling, and it looks real, like real, and, and your CPU is not doing that. So your machine is not too noisy, and you can do other things. Okay, wow. how much time do I have left? 10, 15 minutes? Uh, very quick, what it helped me recently. So you, you find that on the slides, I want to show it in live. I'm doing a lot of hardware work and here's real hardware trays from something. Um, this is serial interface, uh, sending some serial bytes to a microcontroller doing some work and giving the protocol back. And uh, colleagues are using that, so this is the microcontroller I'm working on. 
the real, it's, and this, here it's misused as an SPI bridge. So this is the real work to control our ASIC, and, and this is a protocol which should do other things than just SPI bridging, but for testing, this is fine. They have a side channel and can do a single transfer and another single transfer. Problem is, this is horribly slow. So running the whole, setting up the whole hardware is about 17,000 of these SPI cycles. And if I go in here, it will tell you one of these serials sent a command, wait for the wait for the hardware. This is the small yellow spot and return it. Um, and then for whatever reason, it's always waiting 15 milliseconds in the very low thing. So this with a nice logic analyzer, which I like a lot. Problem was what's happening here in this 15 milliseconds. And this is all the lower thing. So the serial stuff is running in Linux using a regular serial USB serial cable and it's in Python. And we have a lot of uh, automatic system testing and the colleagues came around and said, yeah, a few weeks before it was much, much faster. And now something happened, it's got slower, no specific numbers. Uh, okay, let's have a look at that. And, and now it takes more than four minutes setting up the system. Four minutes is too long. I learned that before it was only a factor of two or four faster, not that much. And yeah, they changed Python libraries, whatever. And it was a little bit unclear what happened. We tried to revert the Python libraries. It didn't help. s -trace. Let's just have a look and get an idea what happened here. And here you can, here you can see the output of s -trace, which I'll now show on. The problem is here, I ca cannot click in that PDF thing and show you what happened. And then get to the right terminal again. This was here. So, and now I have two options. Th this is about the timing, what happens. And I wanted to show you now uh, the decision getting a single trace output, everything in one um, thing, or uh, running the same stuff a second time and seeing which process is doing what and why it might be helpful doing the one way or the other. So this is now what's going on. And I just look for all the reads and writes because I'm just sending some data and, and looking for a good spot where it happens. So this is here is something. This is, oh no, it's not the write which I'm looking for. <laughs> right, nice. X and uh, yeah, this is now the real protocol things with some binary crap, so I'm sending some write command on file descriptor 64. This is our binary stuff going to the microcontroller. The microcontroller does something. And the problem is the read, since everything goes into the same S trace output, um, we have to start looking a little bit, little bit earlier. So one thread starts a read command waiting for output coming back from that protocol thing. Then we send the write command and we are waiting for the return of the things. And here it says read resume because now, uh, oh, I've done, and it's very important then looking at the process ID. So the read started at, with that process ID, then quite often I really use less or whatever and filter out things. The bad thing is in my mind uh, that it says, uh, I'm reading from file descriptor 64, that's nice. If uh, it resumes and says, ah, now I got the data, you don't see the file descriptor anymore. If you want to pick out all communication on file descriptor 64, you won't spot those files. And sometimes it's easy, useful that you can match what I sent out on f either here for the Siri interface or uh, also if you do the same on a network sockets with send and receive, uh, same problem that it's getting intercepted. And also if you look through that, it's hard sometimes to understand what a single thread is doing. But you get a good time sequence. We'll come to that in a second again. If I look at the second example, what for whatever, now there's a, uh, there are a lot, lot of threads running here because it's Python and you're not completely sure which are the interesting ones. So you can, for example, look who is doing how many reads and writes. Uh, uh, here's one thread is doing a lot of read, 300 whatever read. And, and there's also one thread doing a lot of writes. So just looking into those two That was the right thing. Yeah, he was 
no, so write was easy with the other one, so let's ha have a look at the read example. Dum, 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 read, it's this process. Then I can see the full read things, but I don't see how stuff is written. So it's not, I see either the one or the other, you can try to combine those things. The nice thing is if you have absolute timestamps, you just can sort all the things, even just all processes because the other are not doing things, just sort them numerically and combine them and then you're getting sorted by time again. Uh, yeah, let's get them all. And where's my nice example? Oh. Okay, let's look for all the reads and writes again. Oh, dum, 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 dum. And now the nice thing is I got the things by timestamps and it says our oh, read is here, write is here, read is here, write is here. Lo looks reasonable. And the read is not split anymore because now since it's writing to a separate file, you get the full read string whenever it returns. Be careful with that easy method. So it's working quite nice if it's doing independent things and uh, out of time. In this read and write protocol thing, the, I was very confused at looking at the things. I just have to check if I can show you now. Dum, 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 dum. Uh, here, here it's working nice. Point is our protocol has a, a sequencing number in the middle. So this is the um, packet number B8, B8, B9, B9. In this example, read starts before we're writing something with absolute timestamps uh, and it's working fine. Um, I have a different example, maybe we manage that for, uh, for networking, where the threads behave a little bit different and you always get the start of the reach uh, start of the system call as the absolute timestamp. So when s sees you're calling as a read, uh, it will take that timestamp and it can happen in my second example for networking that it first transmits something in, in, the, the, send, in the, the timing of how send and receive are getting started is different. And if you sort that, then the send and receive commands change. So be very careful looking at those things. What's, because now, uh, what I want to show you, this s trace shows that the read takes 15 milliseconds. So the relative timestamp doesn't show it. This is only now we merge things and uh, you get the relative timestamps for everything in a single thread. Um, the relative timestamps make more sense if you have a single file and get a real absolute list of all things going on in your whole process tree. But we see in both methods, if you look at that, uh, the read really takes 15 milliseconds. And if I look at the hardware again, uh, all the bytes arrived and so here the read should, should finalize and say, okay, I have everything. It takes 15 milliseconds. And this is the whole 15 milliseconds we are waiting before we can send the next thing. It's not any Python code, whatever, really the read takes all the time. Okay, and then it was clear while messing around with Python packages, the module did not tell, but did not bring the good performance, which wasn't that good either when I have seen the real numbers. Not sure if I get the right thing. It, it, uh, the, the send and re return things. If you want to have the real, so for receiving information, it's always, most of the time at least, um, you want to know when the data really came in. So if, oh, this is what I have this example for, maybe we can do that in a break later. No, I do that now. So <laughs> I've prepared. So, so this, this is my wonderful IoT device from a hackers conference recently. There's some Python code running on it on DevTI. <laughs> so it's a serial interface where you just get, right, this is a very small micro Python thing, printing temperature, pressure, and other things. This is quite nice, but unfortunately, even it has an ESP32, it doesn't have a battery backup real-time clock, so it doesn't have a reasonable timestamp. And if you want to get those output, this is what S-Trace can do for you. Uh, okay, and I just say, okay, let's do, I want to have the timestamp things and I only want to know the read calls when the data comes in, something like that. Let's try that. And so we have a read call and now I get 
the things with uh, absolute time step for my computer and it's messing around a little bit. So I'll just uh, forget about that output on the terminal that it's easy, ah, that it's easier to read. Def null. Ah, and then my string sizes are too long again. So I have to do S999, give me the full data. And now I have a timestamp and everything. And so, I have, for example, making long story short, write those things in an output file. So that should be sufficient for now. And, and now I have an absolute timestamp and some temperature data and some pressure data and whatever. And whenever I want to look in those data, typically my regular tool is knuplot and I can say plot that file using first column for the timestamp and I always have to go second column, third column, fourth column, fifth, six, column number six for the pressure, for example. A lot of things happen here. Uh -huh. So a little, and if I'm not sure if this is, uh, the, the peak looks like there's some, some other thing I could test now, I'll just say, uh, get only those lines which started with test for whatever. And now I get some graphics about pressure and whatever. So I have absolute timestamps. I can run all input devices, put it to a file, uh, figure out later where the timestamp came out. Just now can look at that. Also very useful method, just getting timestamps for data coming in and analyzing them later, and putting to database, whatever. Yep. So in this case, uh, we notice, okay, the read call is really the problem. And as soon as, if you then do all the math for what I've just shown here, if, I, if you see, um, oh, the read call starts here, you add the time in read, you will notice this is exactly where the next write goes out. So there is no time left for doing Python, any user mode uh, calculations, whatever. So P Python was very fast. So getting that faster, we had to look for the serial interface and things and whatever. And <laughs> looking a little bit in the internet, we learned that for the FTDI serial interfaces, you have a latency timer, uh, which you can enable and disable. And by default, it's enabled and it's just waiting 16 milliseconds for if there's more data, um, that you, it, it's more efficient. And so if, if you do high speed, transf high speed transfers um, and you're waiting for a few more characters, then you have less read calls, that's quite nice. Um, if you disable that and write zero to it, then you will see exactly here in the lower part of it, I also can show that here. And then magically, all these 15 milliseconds go away. So we send a packet, we do a little bit on the microcontroller, we remove a packet, and almost immediately we will do the next serial interface thing. So everything squeezed together. In the early days, because it was so slow, uh, the colleagues always argued, and also I did argue because our microcontroller was running before at a megabout and two megabout and for other reasons in another serial interface, not that one. Uh, colleagues changed it to 115 kilobout because the other interface wasn't able to run any faster. They said, oh, we have to have higher baud rates. As long as I look at that timing picture, uh, speeding up that part of the serial protocol, raising baud rates doesn't make sense because we have to understand the gaps in between. Thanks to S-Trace, we understood them. And now we're in the position that we, and this is quite easy in, in that hardware, we can change on both sides, uh, but it was Friday late evening already, uh, change the baud rate to megabaud. This will give us another factor of eight, speeding up that protocol altogether by a factor of 60 to 80. And then it's running quite fast. And I've heard from colleagues that now the startup is, I think, done in 11 seconds instead of four minutes and they can use that for doing more system testing. What's the timing? It's lunch break. So the last example I would have prepared, um, these are now with sockets and system calls. There you can find the raw data again with S-trace. Um, here I've written things to multiple files, u6 dot whatever with double F. And if you look for the send and receive timestamps, um, you get all the sends in one file, all the receives to other files. And if I, this is where it happened, if I sort them by time, 
Here I cut, uh, I, I clipped off a few of the Unix timestamp digit, otherwise it would, uh, wouldn't have fit in the slides in that font size. This is why it's not 169 whatever absolute timestamp, but it's an absolute timestamp anyway. And sorting that together, um, finally you will see here that the receive comes first, and uh, so this is, the receive will receive the packet with packet ID AC before it's being sent out. So I got totally confused. Uh, this is talking to us. Uh, that server is running in Python, getting a web request, do something for us. This communication is going to a second Python server, which has the real hardware com connection through a different interface. Uh, not that serial interface we have seen here. That's all the hardware is different, and that's running all on an embedded Linux system. And the colleague also came here. It's slowed down, and we don't know why and whatever. Not what we have seen in a serial interface. And then. When I looked at the details, I didn't understand how can I receive something which uh, an answer for the pack, uh, for, for, for the command number AC, where the send goes later. And, and then here I receive something for the command AD, where I send out the command. Reason for that one was that really we get the absolute timestamps when the receive is started, and in 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 that thread only after starting the receive command. Um, the send is being done, and, and it's just sorting bluntly uh, for the absolute timestamp doesn't work. But also here we see uh, that receive waits for nine milliseconds. So this is a little bit indication, and I really have to add this nine milliseconds to the starting time. And this is what I did in, uh, on command line. I like doing things like that in with AWK. So with horrible AWK, whatever, I just get the number from the last thing, add it to the co column number one, add it together. Then if you sort that all, um, then you notice then now I first send that command with sequence AC and a little bit later I receive it and we can have a look at the absolute timestamps. If I just sort out all these timestamps uh, from different files, then the relative timestamps don't make too much sense anymore. With another AWK command, I just can use the absolute things in front. Now these are the read. Now it's always when the read or send returns for the send. It's below a millisecond, so send is very fast. It doesn't matter. But here the read took nine milliseconds for delaying 12 milliseconds, 12 milliseconds, things like that. And if I redo the relative timestamps, I also can see what's taking time. It's really the receive, which is waiting a long time, and in absolute timestamps, the send is only done 12 milliseconds after receive has been received. So in this case, it's not the receive really doing the delay, even it's waiting for 12 milliseconds, but it's only because it got started directly after the last send. And looking at the relative timestamps from, these are the only system calls which are running and are relevant. Um, I can see here now that the, after receiving data, it took 12 milliseconds before I sent the next command. And again, this is code which happens in Python. And now if you dig in. I'm so sorry, we just have another. Uh, oh, okay. So this is all I wanted to show you. Uh, for, uh, for questions, I think we also can meet outside and have a coffee or whatever. So thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Sorry for being late again, but at least I showed all the topics and so if we, we can play around with send and S trace and whatever outside.